Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that would like to remind you that if it gets to shooting, just drop to the ground. Here is the captain. Yeah, if it gets to shooting, I get to scooting. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very happy to be featuring S'more Stout by the very creative brewers over at Untitled Art in Wenaki, Wisconsin. S'more Stout sounds like no description is needed, but we shouldn't leave it to mystery, should we? This is a pastry stout with vanilla beans, candy syrup, milk sugar, and I love it. Garage grade four and a half bottle caps out of five. And I also love our beautiful garage friends. So here's some cheers and praise to a few. First up, a big, double-fisted cheers goes out to Julianne and Ben Jers in wonderful St. Louis. Big shout to Margie D in Parts Unknown. Next up, a big cheers to Brian Unchained in Leavenworth, Kansas. And a big shout to Flippa in Bigsby, Oklahoma. Next up, Captain, we have a cheers to Monique in Compton, California. And last but certainly not least, we have a big Ron Swanson please and thank you that goes out to Anne in Fairfield, Connecticut. Everyone we just mentioned, they helped us out with this week's beer fund, and for that, we thank you. Yeah, B W E W R U N. Do you want to come hang out with us at CrimeCon? You could do so by buying some tickets, and if you want to save some money, TCG10 to get 10% off. You can find tickets at CrimeCon.com. And Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Saturday, July 6, 2019. 25-year-old Chase Engelbert and his 20-year-old wife Bailey lived in Moorcroft, Wyoming, but they had traveled to visit Bailey's family in Garing, Nebraska for the 4th of July holiday. With them was their newborn son, Banks. The family of three stayed with Bailey's grandparents in the 700 block of O Street in Garing. On Saturday, Chance played golf with Bailey's father and brother. The group drank a bunch of beers and had a great time. Bailey drove to the course to join them. This is because when Chance called her after the round of golf, he was in a great mood. By the time she arrived, the mood had changed. Apparently, there had been some kind of argument, and now Chance was ready to go home to Moorcroft, Wyoming. Fast forward to less than 24 hours later. At 11 a.m. the next morning, Bailey called the Garing Police Department and reported Chance missing. She told the officer that she had last seen her husband at 7.30 p.m. that Saturday evening. When Chance walked away from their car that was parked in the driveway of Bailey's grandparents' home, and he never came back. This is True Crime Garage, and this is the missing persons case of Chance Engelberg. Bailey reported her husband Chance missing on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. This is after she spoke to Chance's parents and his friends. No one had seen or heard from Chance. No one had any idea where he might be. And of course, Chance was not answering calls or responding to text. When Bailey spoke with the Garing PD, she said the police were not super helpful at first. They thought maybe Chance was drunk and had just walked off. Maybe he was upset with her or her family. Is it possible that he just needed a little time and would return when he cooled off? Now, we have to explain an argument that seems to have taken place at some point during the golf trip. After the golf trip, sounds to me, Captain, like everybody's still having a good time. What a great day. We're golfing. It's a Saturday. 
having some beers. After a round of golf, we sit down, we have a couple more beers, and through conversation, there's some kind of argument that takes place between Chance and a member or members of Bailey's family. This is after he's already spoke to his wife and she says, I'm picking him up because he says he was in a good mood and we had other plans that afternoon. Right. When she arrives, the mood had changed. Chance is mad. Bailey says she doesn't really know exactly what's going on at that time, but they get in the car and he's saying, I want to go home. And he doesn't mean I want to go home to your grandparents' house where we're staying for the weekend. I want to go home to our home in Wyoming. By the time they arrive at the grandparents' home, Chance is reminding her, hey, I want to go home. I don't want to go to your family's house. Bailey says that she last saw Chance around 7.30 p.m. when he is walking away from their parked car that is in the driveway of her grandparents' home. So that was Saturday, and we'll continue to flesh out this timeline as we go through the case. But as said... Bailey reports Chance missing at 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. The police seem to agree that there's a possibility he's just upset and he needs a little bit of time and that he will show up. He'll return to them at some point. But when Chance does not surface by Monday, his family was freaking out. And so they called the police station begging them to search for Chance. The police took action and began to mobilize. Search crews set up an emergency management mobile command unit at the YMCA Trails West Camp in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Searchers were to be on the lookout for the missing man described as follows. Caucasian, about 5 foot 9 inches tall, with a medium build. He has sun-lightened brown hair, a mustache and goatee, and on the day of his disappearance he was wearing a short-sleeved Wrangler shirt, Wrangler jeans, roper boots, but some reports say He may have been wearing sneakers and a black and white trucker ball cap. That day, Garing Police Captain Jason Rogers confirmed to the Star Herald that authorities were actively searching along the North Platte River and railroad property. And the paper reported that the Scotts Bluff Fire Department dive team members were spotted searching along the North Platte River. By mid-afternoon, law enforcement and emergency personnel had gathered near the North Platte River Bridge. They walked the entire area between the YMCA camp and the bridge. This was no longer in Garing, but in the Terrytown neighborhood of Scottsbluff, about an hour's walk north of the small town where Chance had last been seen by his wife. Now, why are they looking there? The answer is they had found digital evidence that Chance might be in this location. Well, this is because law enforcement asked local businesses to turn in any surveillance tape that might have an individual on it that could be chance. Yeah, it's it's actually a little more broad than that. What they're asking, and this is something that we've seen in pretty common in most of these missing persons cases, where they are asking for property owners to search their properties, see if they can find anything that is out of the norm. But also, turn in any surveillance camera footage that you have, let us review it, and let us see if we see anything that may be important to our missing persons case. And footage of Chance showed up in Northwest Garing and Southwest Scottsbluff. So let's back up here for just a second, Captain. When Chance left Bailey's grandparents' home, he got out of his and Bailey's car. Again, this is at the 700 block of O Street, and started walking. Now, no one saw him leave. No one really knew what direction he was walking or where he was going, for that matter. But these surveillance videos on some local establishments showed him walking northbound on 10th Street, a major north-south road in Garing, at approximately 7.40 p.m. on Saturday. At 7.51 p.m., he was seen at the intersection of Martha Road and 10th Street, This is 1.5 miles from O Street, from where he left. Captain Rogers confirmed to the Star Herald that Chance was spotted on surveillance video walking past two businesses in Garing and an apartment in Terrytown, a part of Scotts Bluff which abuts Garing in the northwest corner. Rogers also confirmed that Chance was walking northbound on 10th Street in Garing, 
and turned west onto Martha Road into Terrytown. The last video shows him walking in the area of the intersection of Terry Boulevard and Stable Club Road in Terrytown. Now, this is interesting because it doesn't make sense to walk all the way up 10th to Martha Road and then turn left to get to Stable Club Road. 10th intersects with Stable Club Road south of Martha Road. So either Chance wasn't familiar with this area or he was walking without really having any particular destination. He's just kind of roaming, I guess. A couple of things, though, is, is Bailey's statements have been a little conflicting. At one point, she says that she saw Chance walk away from their truck heading north. And then other times she said that she hadn't seen him leave because she was inside uh, trying to pack up some things and with their child. Stable Club Road continues in a northwesterly direction through a residential area and then crosses Five Rocks Road, whereupon it turns into Owl Road and proceeds into a somewhat desolate area. This is along the North Platte River, parallel to the railroad tracks, just on the northern side of Scotts Bluff National Monument. Now, to be clear, this is not an area covered by dense woods. We are talking about the plains here, just miles and miles of flat land with few trees and many lakes and ponds. An overhead view of the area looks like a patchwork quilt with all the squares of farm and pasture land punctuated by the Scotts Bluff Monument area, Mm -hmm. which resembles gray rock with very little growth. In other words, it would be very difficult. It would be hard for someone to disappear in this area as it is wide open spaces. But we would later learn that search parties did search this area and, of course, had no luck finding chance. Yeah, they searched them with search parties, but also cadaver dogs and scent dogs. Yes. By four days out, the search for chance was quite massive. We have 16 agencies that were involved in the search efforts. Helicopters provided air support to more than 50 ground searchers. A drone was used to image the area from the air. Tracking dogs were brought in. I'm not quite sure what, if any, of the results were regarding the dogs. The water to the Garing Central Canal was cut off so search crews could get a better look at its depths. The drone operator flew his drone the length of the canal starting at Five Rocks Road and following it to the river. Cadaver dogs, as the captain said, also searched the canal between Stable Club Road and Woodley Park Road. Terry's Lake, which Chance would have had to have walked by, was also among the areas searched with the cadaver dogs. And searches of the North Platte River were done by the fire department using watercraft to examine the surface. But from my understanding, Captain, the depths of the river were not searched. Yeah, so a couple of things that make this even more difficult is he's last seen by his wife at around 7 p.m. Then we have some surveillance footage from a local business that sees him around 9 and that's his last known whereabout. But that's also about the time that his cell phone is seems to not be working. Yes, and we do have some cell phone data to discuss here. The police confirmed that the Nebraska State Patrol was consulted to try to obtain Chance's phone's tracking information. And what they learned dictated what would be the search area. Right. It was originally reported that Chance's phone last pinged in the vicinity of Owl Road, just south of the Western Travel Terminal Truck Stop and Convenience Store. This is a busy truck stop, but it's not on the interstate, I-80. It's about an hour away. So again, a busy truck stop, but not directly on the interstate. Now, when this information came out, everyone started to think, well, Maybe Chance hitched a ride at the truck stop and got out of Dodge. But no video footage was found of him at the truck stop. Right. And police began to suspect that he was never there at all. Then people focused on the vicinity of Owl Road, which was where they said his phone last pinged. This is approximately, of course. 
Owl Road is a desolate road along the banks of the North Platte River and the continuation of Stable Club Road, which makes sense because we already talked about the direction that we know he was walking. This is on the western side of Five Forks Road. Owl Road follows the river west and then crosses the river in a sort of dam. This is where Owl Road ends. But that information would change because eventually Garing Police Department said that in actuality, the cell phone data was very inexact. They did not have a specific location for the last ping. Rather, they only had a very general area, an arc, as the police put it, in which the phone ping could have originated. The arc was fairly large, two miles long, covering an area encompassing Scotts Bluff National Monument property in Garing all the way to West 25th Street in Scotts Bluff. This is according to the police. And they went on to say, quote, because of cell phone technology, this is according to police. And they went on to say, quote, because of cell phone technology, the information did not greatly narrow down the area Chance may have last used his cell phone. Rather, the phone had been used in an area two to three miles south to southeast toward Garing and toward Tarringtown. Well, again, the events of the day that he went missing, his wife sees him walk away about 7 p.m. He's seen again on surveillance around 9, but there was a pretty severe storm that night. So I think that's also what led them. We know he was roughly in this area by this water. Well, at that point, that river would have been pretty running pretty high and pretty rough. Yes, and this cell phone information, evidence, if you will, is quite confusing because we're told that his phone pinged off of a tower located near Riverview Golf Course northwest of Scotts Bluff. This is around 10 p.m. on Saturday, but we should note here that the police have since backed off of this time. They now seem to believe that the phone was shut off or turned off itself shortly after his last text communication, which was around 9.15 p.m. The last time Chance's phone was used had been shortly after 9 p.m. So what was Chance doing since he left his in-law's house at 7.30 p.m.? Well, it makes you wonder, too, because this is not, this is not Chance's hometown. This is his wife's hometown. He's heading north. We we know that. The evidence kind of points towards that. He had some communication with his friends and family, and he told them he was heading north. So at least he had some kind of sense of direction. But Bailey said at some point when she was talking to Chance that he said that he was heading south, and maybe maybe he was just confused at that time, or maybe she misheard him. Of course, police confirmed early on that Chance had not returned to his home in Moorcroft. Uh, Wyoming authorities were conducting their own searches, and friends and family of Chance's drove in from Wyoming and South Dakota to help look for him. But their efforts, sadly, were in vain. The searches turned up no sign of Chance, no sign of his personal items, and no sign of his clothing or his cell phone. After several days, the family raised a reward, which eventually grew to $10,000. Chance's mom, Dawn, his brothers, and Bailey, and Baby Banks spoke to the media and implored the public to relay any information. Dawn said that Chance went for a walk for a few hours to clear his head, but he would never have stayed away from his baby boy this long. They say that this is not like him, she said. He was a family man. He worked hard. He was responsible. He paid the bills. Yeah, it's not uncommon for people to get in an argument. Maybe he wasn't in an argument with Bailey that night, but he was definitely in an argument and upset about something. So, hey, I'm going to clear my head. That's pretty normal, I would think. Maybe not showing up the next morning, a little abnormal, but... On top of that, Chance was recently laid off at his job. I believe there was 600 people at a mining company that were they're laid off at their job. But he got a new job that he was supposed to start on that Monday at a propane company. 
So this is a significant moment when he doesn't show up to that job on Monday morning. That that's that's a that's a pretty big red flag that there's something wrong. Mm-hmm. Well, how about we dive into their lives a little bit before the disappearance here, Captain? Yeah. Uh, Chance was born on December third, nineteen ninety three. His parents are Everett and Don Engelbert. He has two younger brothers, Miles and Clay, and the family is very close, but there seems to have been some turmoil leading up to his disappearance, and we'll get into that, but let's stick with happier times for now. Chance was particularly close with his brothers, according to his family. These relationships that Chance's family says, look, there's no way this guy is just walking off and leaving this life behind him. His family echoes what others are saying as well, that he was very responsible and would not walk out on his son, on his obligations, leaving Bailey and Banks high and dry. Now, Chance was raised in Edgemont in South Dakota, and calling him a horseman is, well, it's an understatement. You can see rodeo footage of him online riding bucking Broncos He competed in rodeos while in high school. He eventually earned a scholarship to a community college in Cheyenne, Wyoming for rodeo riding. He attended the school from 2012 to 2016, earning degrees in welding and diesel mechanics. He rode bareback horses and bulls for the college rodeo team. Now, his hobby outside of work and riding was demolition derby. He and his brothers love to work on cars and such and then trash them in adrenaline-filled competitions. As said, he's a trained welder. Chance got a job at a coal mine in Gillette, Wyoming in 2017. This goes to show that he is responsible. He had worked there since 2017 leading up to his disappearance. In late 2017, this is when he meets Bailey. And the two had a quick courtship and an engagement before tying the knot in late 2018. They had a baby six months later. This is Banks. Bailey was only 20 years old when Chance went missing, so she's quite young. He's 25. The couple moved to Moorcroft, Wyoming, a few months earlier and had just bought a new house. Chance continued working for the mine just before he went missing, as the captain said. This is a week before he goes missing. Right. He gets this bad news. He is one of 580 workers abruptly laid off when Black Jewel LLC closed two coal mines without notice. They didn't, they didn't give anybody any real notice here. This is Well, that's nice of them. Yeah, well, it, this is because they filed for bankruptcy which was denied on July 1st. So they intended to continue the business and keep right. the employees. However, the motion was denied. Well, Chance was a young guy. Like you said, he's 25 years old, handsome kid. He, he kind of reminds me of Rip from Yellowstone. We'll post pictures of Chance and, and Bailey and their, their kid on our social medias. You can find all those links at truecrimegarage.com. And as the captain pointed out, the family was shocked. You know, they're not shocked that he took off walking huff and puff when he's angry, but they were shocked when he didn't show up to start that new job at Blakeman Propane in Moorcroft on Monday, July 8th. Well, my my first question when I was reading this was, we, we know what he was wearing. We have a very, pretty good description from Bailey of what he was wearing. She even says it's like a grayish purple Wrangler shirt. She knew what Wrangler jeans he was wearing. So, when there's conflicting stories of whether he's wearing boots or tennis shoes, funny to me because she's saying, well, he's wearing this, this, this. And then when you see him on that surveillance footage, you, you can kind of pick out those items uh, that he's wearing. This is not golf attire, but there's pictures of him. I don't think it's of that day, but it's other times of him golfing, and that's what he wore, golfing. A Wrangler shirt. Uh, Wrangler button-up shirt, Wrangler jeans, boots, and a trucker hat. Well, everybody golfs in different attire if the course will allow you. Jim McMahon golfs barefoot. Mm. So there you go. I golf naked. We need to point out here, too, if if it was missed by anybody out there, that by this point, Chance and Bailey 
if you go back before the marriage, they had been together for nearly two years at this point when he disappeared. And she is describing him as a supportive husband. He's the breadwinner. He's taking care of her and now their small family. Yeah, Bailey currently wasn't working. Others paint a less rosy picture of the situation. Chance's buddy DJ told um, the Vanish podcast that Bailey and Chance lived with him for a short period of time. He said that Bailey and Chance would argue quite a bit about stupid stuff is what he called it. Like she thought he was talking to his mother too much or she would accuse him of doing stuff that DJ says he simply wasn't doing. And Chance's family agrees with this, with this statement. It sounds to me, Captain, like Bailey was a little difficult with Chance uh, from these different stories that we're hearing. Now, of course, with Chance missing, unfortunately, he never showed up at his new workplace on July 8th. According to everyone, this was a very, very bad sign. Many of them had been holding out hope that Chance had, for whatever reason, walked off and somehow made his way home and would show up to work on Monday. They said he simply was not that type of guy to miss work. are back to the windows to the walls cheers everybody cheers captain now by the 12th of july keep in mind chance is missing for six days by this point the police said that they had covered a lot of ground in the search for him and struck out and we've had several police and fire agencies including the nebraska state patrol involved in the searches for chance these searches were primarily in northwest terrytown and southwest scotts bluff Ground searches covered everything from the river's banks, canyons, under bridges, abandoned trailers, and even the interiors of older cars at a local auto dealer. Select portions of the National Park were scoured, including some badland areas. The State Patrol helicopter scanned over 100 miles of ground. The Nebraska State Patrol Airlink unit covered 280 miles in total. Sonar and canine were used to search 10 lakes and ponds. Investigators also canvassed neighborhoods in Terrytown going door to door. In all, 2,400 acres had been searched. Now, per KNOP News 2, the Garing police chief said, quote, we are going to be transitioning from an actively searching phase to a phase focusing more on the investigation doing more with cell phones, interviews with family, co-workers, and other people in the lives of Chance Engelbert, end quote. So, Captain, they are going to figure out if something else happened to Chance and really hone in on that at this point. So as we continue to dig through Chance's life, his family, his social circles, and the events before and after he went missing, keep in mind that we are really dealing with only a handful of possibilities here. One, Chance walked off to start a new life, never contacting anyone. Two, Chance took off walking because he was pissed off and got lost or injured and passed away somewhere out there. Three, Bailey and or her family knows more about what happened but aren't talking. Maybe they are responsible or know who is. And four, someone or someones got to Chance while he was out walking and did away with him. Well, when he took off walking, it wasn't like he had zero contact with anybody. He made contact with his best friend, Matt Miller, talked to him and was trying to get a ride back home. Mm -hmm. Then Matt Miller contacts Chance's family, and they were trying to get a hold of him and, and had some communication with him before the cell phone was turned off or went dead. And as far as this phase in the investigation goes, Captain, we know how this goes. We've seen it before. Law enforcement will review Chance's life, his social circles, and of course his finances. Police confirmed that his bank card had not been used 
and later verified that there was never any unusual activity on Chance's financial accounts. Now, police also began to investigate rumors and more outlandish theories. One of these was that Bailey's family was involved in Chance's disappearance, as it was reported that a family friend had just poured concrete at a property that they owned. Now, that theory was quickly debunked. Garing PD officer Sean West said, quote, in such cases, there are often rumors that circulate in the community. But he said that actually police had no evidence whatsoever that Chance was the victim of foul play. Chance's mother, Dawn, disagrees, saying that she felt that someone knows something about what happened to her son. Well, they've asked the lead investigator, Brian Eads, about with the possibility did Chance meet with foul play. And he said, look, we, we're going to investigate it as such. There's no evidence that says that he did, but there's no evidence that says that he didn't. One of the avenues police went down in their investigation is one that they have tried to downplay probably to protect the family and avoid contributing to rumor and gossip. But the police chief said that if Chance did run away, he would not face any criminal charges. Quote, there's no repercussions. If that's what happened and Chance needed a break to decompress, whatever, there is no criminal charges. He has not committed a crime, end quote. At this point in our timeline, though, roughly six days into his disappearance, Chance's mother issues a statement about concerns that Chance may have gone missing on purpose. And then Baby Banks posted the following on Facebook. Here's what happened according to Banks, who is actually Bailey, of course. Says, hi, my name is Banks Chance Engelbert. My dad went missing on July 6, 2019. My daddy had a couple of rough weeks. He was laid off at the mine, though he had a new job starting the next Monday. On Saturday, July 6, he was golfing with some family members at the Bayard Golf Course. Daddy got upset about a remark made about his job, and he was one of hundreds laid off from the mine. Providing for mom and I was important to him, and I think his pride was at stake. Daddy called mom Bailey to get him at the golf course. When we got back to my great-grandparents' house, Mommy and I went in to pack our stuff because Daddy wanted to go back home to Moorcroft. Daddy didn't come inside but took off walking around 7.20. Daddy talked to Mom a couple of times on the phone. From phone records, we know Daddy called a couple of friends. We were told he asked one to come get him. He was going to Torrington, but friend said he was unable to. He had two unanswered calls from his mom. That is the extent of his phone records before his phone was shut off. He was spotted on camera at 748 by Weathercraft Roofing in Garing, Nebraska. Daddy maybe was on a ring camera at 801 by Terry Boulevard in Terrytown, Nebraska. This is debatable. At 908, he sent a weird text to his Aunt Katie, And about 9.15, his phone was shut off. Again, note, times are approximate. That was the last text. This is the last time Daddy was heard from. Where are you, Daddy? Did you just walk away from me and Mom? I don't think so. Did somebody pick you up? We don't know. Did you run into some trouble? I wish we knew. Does somebody know something? I'm sure of it. Wherever you are, Daddy, Mom and I want you home. There are so many people that love you. Wow, that's a smart baby. But let's start off with this golfing event. There's some speculation that this event never even happened, but I'd like to know more details about the argument, what was said. It seems like it was something pretty simple that his new job wasn't going to pay as much as his old job, but it seems like a weird comment to blow up about. That may be, and and a lot of that sounds to be at least what we're being told, right? Because we don't know the exact argument, how it went down, and and who was all involved. Now, according to Bailey, we do have a a pretty lengthy statement that I can give here from Bailey. This is what she told uh, The Vanished, and it has more details about, according to her at least, the mood that Chance was in during that time frame. 
And again, this is quoting from The Vanished. It says, we were just... We were just down visiting our family and the guys all decided that they wanted to go golfing. So him, my brother-in-law and my dad, they went down to bear golf course and drank a lot and golfed a lot. And I don't know, had fun. He called me and we were supposed to meet some friends for dinner that night. And he was in a super good mood. So I drove out there to the golf course. I got the baby out of the car and I started walking over to where everyone was sitting and he stood up being chance. He being chance. He stood up and said, get the fuck back in the car. We're leaving. So I thought that was really weird. So I was kind of looking at everyone and they were looking at me and everyone is just super confused. We left and I canceled plans with my friends And he had misunderstood something that somebody had said about the mine shutting down. Because in Nebraska, the minimum wage, I mean, it's hard to make really good money in Nebraska. Even if you're super skilled, you're not going to be paid worth a shit compared to what you are in Wyoming. And so they made a comment about at least he wasn't making minimum wage. By Nebraska standards, he was making good money and he would just... And he just took it the wrong way. So he was upset about that and he really wanted to go home. And he had been drinking just enough that there was no talking any sort of sense into him. So I just kind of went with it and I was like, okay, cool, we'll go home. So I drove to my grandparents in Gehring, Nebraska, where we had been staying, and I went in to pack my bag. We pulled into the driveway and he said, no, I said I wanted to go home. And I was like, yeah, just hold on. I'm going to go grab our bags and we'll leave. Well, he took off walking and I ran the baby inside and handed him to my grandma and ran back outside. And I started driving around looking for him. Yeah, the podcast, The Vanish, uh, Marissa Jones, she she does really good work. So if you're into missing person cases, make sure you check out her podcast. Bailey said that Chance had a temper and when they argued in the past... He would leave and he would go to the shop to work on his demo derby cars and have a beer. Obviously, in this situation, Captain, he's quite a ways away from going and working on cars and having a beer. Yeah, but he he was determined to get back there. She said he was the type to get pissed off, but then get over it. And he was not the type to harbor resentment. Chance's friends agree with this statement. But they all agree it was also totally out of character for him not to come back. Now, Bailey was eager, and I. this is one thing that we've seen continually in the course of this case and over the couple of years since he has gone missing. Bailey has dismissed media reports that it was actually her that Chance was mad at. You know, she has said time and time again the argument was not between her and Chance, that this whatever happened went down at the golf course And it sounds to me like it went down in a relatively short period of time because everything's going good. And I I think it's key to point out here that Bailey is saying, I went to pick him up because he called me. He was in such a good mood. That implies to me that the plan was not for her to pick him up, that he would just return with the guys after they were done golfing. But those plans changed when he calls and they decide, you know what, Bailey's going to go pick him up. It's roughly about a 20-minute drive-ish from the grandparents' house to the golf course. Right. So assuming that she receives that call while she's at the grandparents' house, within 20 minutes, that, that mood changes from super good mood to, hey, get the fuck back in the car. We're leaving. This is what's difficult, too, is we don't know what was said or maybe what he thought was implied by a comment. And it seems to me, hey, look, get back in the car. We're leaving. I'm done with this shit. This guy has a lot on his plate anyways. I mean, he just lost a career job. Now he needs to find another job because he needs to support his family or he wishes to support his family. He might have left out some details when he talked to Bailey because maybe there's something that was said that would also offend her and he didn't want to bring her into the argument. It's not out of line to think that maybe Bailey was like, hey, look, calm down. They probably didn't mean that. Maybe you misunderstood them. 
Everybody knows how it is when you're a little mad. And we could assume at this point he's a little drunk or a little intoxicated. And when somebody tells you, hey, why, why don't you just chill out? <laughs> or why don't you calm down? For whatever reason, that always, for me anyways, is gasoline on the fire. Oh, you want me to chill out? <laughs> now I'm going to get even more mad. So maybe his walking away from the situation was, I already got in an argument with her family. I don't want to get in an argument with her. Right. And I, I'm not going to lie, man. I have a difficult time believing that there was no argument between Chance and Bailey inside the car. She says that there wasn't and that, she, that he wasn't mad at her. I can believe that he wasn't mad at her. But I have a hard time believing that a 20-minute drive, there's not some words exchanged, and maybe by the end of the drive, yes, he wasn't mad at her at the start of the drive, but probably just mad at the whole situation by the time they get to her grandparents' house. Right, and again, if she's saying to him, hey, I, I think maybe you misunderstood, in a sense, you're going, hey, you're sticking up for them. So, yeah, I could see him being pretty snarky towards her. By the end of that drive. And I want to throw something else out there too. You know, we, we mentioned some conflicting stories and I'll give some opinions on that here in just a second, but that, that statement is important to read from the vanish podcast because I believe that interview was just about four months or so after he went missing. Mm -hmm. But then we have an interview with Dateline where Bailey tells Dateline, and this is a quote, quote, he gets mad. He'll walk to cool down, but I didn't think he'd go far. He just kept walking until I couldn't see him. I didn't think he was serious, end quote. So that seems to imply a different scenario, right? Right. When when you hear the one statement to the Vanish podcast of, oh, you know, I went inside. He said he wanted to leave. I went inside, told him I'm going to grab our things and we'll go. And then later her statement to Dateline is, well, he just kept walking until I couldn't see him anymore. Yes. And, and that that's my first issue. My first issue is the one statement makes it sound like you're in the house when he leaves. The next statement makes it sound like you are watching him walk away. One statement makes it seem like there was no argument and he wasn't mad at you. The other one, when you're watching him walk away, seems like it's implied that he's also upset with you. So... It's, uh, you know, she's been getting a lot of grief lately because she hasn't been doing interviews. And, you know, look, when your husband goes missing and there's an argument with your family, people are going to question your demeanor. They're going to qu question the details of your words. Well, and therein lies the problem with this case. If, if Bailey and her family's being 100% authentic and honest, then there's no concerns to be had, but you question all of that and you don't know. We don't, because we don't know these individuals, we don't know her family. It's hard for us to sit here and go, okay, well that rings true to me. And let's just roll with that. Something else happened to this guy. Now I do want to point out something here too, that I think must be said in Bailey's defense in regard to these two interviews where what she says, it seemingly paints a different picture. Mm-hmm. To be clear on my opinion of, of her two statements, yes, it's possible that this is two conflicting statements. However, I also believe that there is a possibility that these statements are completely truthful. They're just lacking detail to connect the two stories. Right. You know, it could be something as simple as, yes, she, she left out a couple details in one version and a couple details in the other version. But there's also a possibility that both are not completely truthful and maybe she's sugarcoating the situation. Maybe there were some other words that were exchanged. Mm -hmm. You know, I could see a scenario where they're arguing in the car on the way back and she says, no, we're staying. He says, we're going home to Moorcroft. She says, no, we're staying. We're just staying one more night and we'll leave tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And this is when it comes to push and pull here. Who's in charge? And we've all seen this. We've witnessed it as children with our parents. I've experienced it as an adult as well. There's no really clear definition of who is in charge in these situations when mom wants one thing and dad wants the other. And so do we have a situation where 
He says, we're going home. She says, no, we're staying another night. We'll leave in the morning. Get over it. Grow up. She takes the keys and the baby inside. And now he's left in the car or left standing in the driveway with two options. I can either tip my hat and ride, walk on out of this bitch, or I can go in to the grandparents' house where I said I wasn't going, where I said I was not returning to. Well, Colonel, you have a foul, filthy mouth is what you have on you. Let me throw another wrinkle into the story. Originally, they were supposed to go out on a couple's weekend with Chance's friend Matt and his girlfriend. They're going to go to a cabin in South Dakota and go catfishing. At the last minute, Chance called up Matt and said, hey, now we're going to Bailey's family's house. And even, we should point out too, even if the argument did turn to him against her and her against him, that doesn't necessarily mean that Bailey did anything nefarious or her family has. There's still a a very plausible situation that he storms off in the old huff and puff and something bad happened to him be it the elements or be something else, you know, some kind of run in with trouble, Mm -hmm. uh, when he's attempting to make it back to his home in, in Moorcroft. What I do see here though, that is very clear to me with the phone calls that he makes with his actions. I don't know if this is a situation where he's going to get over it, that he's going to cool off after an hour. Like he would when, if they were home, this seems to me like he's, he's make, he's making his stand. This is his hill that he's willing to die on. And he's going to go, you know what? I'm going to find my own way back home. And when she is done with her family, she'll come home and I'll already be here. And we should also point out too something that's very obvious in this situation, but it seems to be kind of, kind of like brushed over a little bit. Like it's always mentioned in different In in some of the articles, I shouldn't say all the articles, it's always mentioned in some of the articles and it's always mentioned in some of the, the, the news and media, media coverage, but it's always kind of glossed over chances. Family and Bailey's family did not get along. Nope. They were not like a United front of, you know, what, what, what some people are, what some people experience where when you marry into a family, be it the the husband or wife or what have you, you then become part of that family. No, this was this was the Bailey camp and Chance's camp. The other thing too that's weird going on here, even though Chance was very close with his family, and we know that even by some of the statements of the friends that that Bailey would get on to him about talking to his mother too much. Even though he seems to be very close with his family, it doesn't seem like he was close or getting along with his family at the time that he went missing. Right. So there's a lot of stuff going on in these two young people's lives. He's 25. She's 20. They got a new house, new baby. He's been laid off. He's getting, starting a new job. And it sounds like she was getting ready to start uh, some type of schooling at this time too. Now, according to Bailey, her and some of her family went looking for Chance that night. And as we said that night and the next morning, they are calling Chance and everyone they know to try to locate him or someone who has seen him or spoke to him. Then they report him missing to police. Now, the family has given, Bailey's family, has given some more information about the timeline. Bailey last spoke with Chance on the phone at 7.46 p.m. on Saturday night after he walked off. According to her, he told her he was walking south. The captain pointed this out earlier, heading toward Kimball. As we know, he was actually walking north and west instead. He apparently did not want Bailey to find him, or he's already lost at this point. Yeah, or he misspoke, or she misheard him. Chance was on the phone for the next hour, approximately, calling people asking for a ride. He said he was walking to Torrington, Wyoming. This would be about a 35-mile walk. I don't know about you, Captain, but I'm not in the business of conducting many 35-mile walks. Well, once I do a round of golf, I like to pound a bunch of beers and then get about a 40-mile walk in. Getting some verbal altercations and, and yeah. walk a, a good 35 miles. I do want to pause for a second because we, we talked about the 
tension within the family. I, I just want to talk about that for just a second. Because one, from what I've been told, when they got together, because she was she was younger than he was, the, the what I was told is that she initially lied to Chance about her age. Then they start the relationship. There was conflicts right away. She doesn't like his family. Again, I, I don't like any relationship. Look, we've seen this in many cases. It's a tactic of abusers to separate their partner from their family. And it doesn't matter if it's the wife doing it to the husband or the husband doing it to the wife. I, I don't like those situations. I think your spouse, if if you have good family members that love you and care about you, your partner should always be supportive of you having a great relationship. Doesn't mean that that the you know doesn't mean that you have to have a great relationship with them, but you should should be supportive of your partner having a good relationship with their family. When they got married, she made a big fuss and there was a big blow up because she didn't want his family there. Now I just think that's pretty ridiculous. And but again, I think some of this ridiculousness is coming because of their age and their maturity or lack thereof and but again, you're commenting on situations where we we just don't know. We can't claim to fully understand. I I get it that she didn't want his family there, but who's to say he didn't want her family there? Right. Um this these are th- details we just don't know and we could you could look at this through two different lenses one that maybe suggests that she is trying to separate him from his family but there's also the other version where he seems to whatever have reason for whatever reasons not be close with his family leading up to his disappearance and that may have nothing to do with Bailey i i don't believe that it has nothing to do with Bailey but right. i but there's a chance that it has very little to do with her and maybe more so with the dynamics of the relationship that he has with his parents and and brothers at the time. Yeah. Good point. And as the captain pointed out, one of the friends that chance called that night was Matt Miller. Matt was chance's best man at his wedding. Matt gave an interview that was informative. He says that chance called him that night and Matt was in Gillette, Wyoming at the time. And chance told him that he had gotten into a fight with his in-laws and he was walking down the road toward Torrington and needed a ride home. Matt says that Chance did not sound drunk or disoriented, but he did sound angry. Matt says he had been drinking all day and could not go to pick up Chance, right. but told Chance that he would make some calls. Then he calls Dawn, which is Chance's mother, and she said she was going to call Chance's uncle John, and John was going to go get him. So then Matt, the friend, tries to call Chance back to let him know, hey, your Uncle John is going to come out and get you. Right. But now he's getting no answer when he's calling Chance. This, to me, seems to be the line in the sand in our timeline here, Captain, where we know, and, and I think for very good reason. One, we know Chance reached out to this person for help. He seems determined to get out of the area. He calls his buddy for help. It seems to me of all the calls, I believe that there are people in Chance's life at this time, at the day that he went missing, that if they called his phone or text him, he may not respond to. Right. But not Matt. When Matt is calling him back, he is going to answer, if he is able to, he will answer that call because he has asked Matt for a ride. Matt, his best man, tells him, I can't pick you up, but I will find someone to do so. So this is a call that really kind of, kind of scares me, kind of shakes me here when I think of what is going on and what could have happened to, to chance. It seems to me like some, whatever went down, it started to get bad between the time he gets off the phone with Matt and the time that Matt is trying to get a hold of chance later to let him know, Hey, your uncle John is, is going to come and try to pick you up. But again, like we said, Chance had been drinking. I, look, I'm not saying Matt's a liar. 
by any means. I think uh, the interviews that Matt has done, it, you know, I applaud him for taking the time and to try to share his thoughts on um, on this case. He seems to be, show that he very much cares about his missing friend and just wants answers, just like the, so many people in this case. Um, I'd go as far as to say I like the cut of Matt's jib, but I agree with you. When Matt, he reaches out to Matt, when Matt reaches back out, he doesn't answer. Now, I don't think he didn't answer because he didn't want to. I think at that point, he's probably not capable. Or the phone is dead. Yes, phone is dead. You know, there is some speculation on on whether the phone got shut off or not. I don't think Chance is going to reach out for help and then turn his phone off. That doesn't make any sense. But, But back to what I was saying is when he says, well, Chance didn't sound drunk. Look, your perceptions of things are impaired if you've been drinking all day. So, And I would like to know just how long that conversation was. It doesn't seem like it was that long of a conversation. So if somebody's mad, maybe that masks the little bit of intoxication because that footage that you see where he takes that 90-degree turn, you know what? video I'm talking about Mm -hmm. because that video is how they kind of conducted their search. It's the last known sighting of chance Mm -hmm. when he turns his body on a 90 degree angle. He then has to like reset his balance. He almost like when he, the first initial step to me, he looks that like he lost his balance almost. I had a state trooper look at that video. Never didn't tell him that the person was missing. Didn't tell the per, didn't tell the state trooper that this guy had been drinking at all. And he would just all he said to me is, "If I was doing a sobriety test and somebody made a movement like that, that that would, you know, be a, a big point against them." So I think in that video, it's hard to tell. I mean, you can see him walk for a decent amount of distance, but to me, he still seems intoxicated. Well, and that certainly will play into the possibilities of what could have happened to chance because, you know, we have everybody, including Matt that is telling us, look, you know, this guy was into hunting. He's an outdoorsman. He's a rodeo rider. You have to be pretty damn physically fit to ride in the rodeo. And he says that, you know, I don't think that he would have fallen into the river because he was sure-footed, because he was an outdoorsman. But again, you factor in the possibility that he was intoxicated and then later the bad weather that's going to come in to the area. I think you have to leave that as a as a possibility here in this situation. Now, Chance's mother told the story from her perspective, saying that on Saturday afternoon, July 6th, the day he went missing, Chance's dad, Everett, texted Chance to tell him that there was a package at their house for him. And Chance responds saying that they would be back in town on Sunday as he was starting a new job on Monday. Now, we know that Matt Miller says he receives the call from Chance and tells Chance, hey, I'm going to try to get, or tells us anyway, that he is going to try to get in touch with Chance's family to see if he can get somebody to go pick him up because, hey, I've been drinking all day. This destination is several hours away. I can't go get my friend. Well, Dawn, when she tells us what happened that night, she says, yes, she received the call from, from Matt and tells Matt, yeah, we'll reach out to him, I guess, but I'm not sure if he'll want to talk to us. Meaning chance may not want to talk to us. This is his mother saying that, but either his uncle or somebody will reach out and try to get to him. So this to me means that there was some kind of tension or bad blood going on within Chance and his family because his mother's own words are, I'm not sure that he would want to talk to us. And so she had the uncle and his aunt all text him and call him to see about picking him up. And then she says, you know, he wouldn't answer any calls or text from from the family. Now, if that was his, by choosing, that's one thing we simply don't know. Or if he was unable to, for any number of reasons, that's a possibility as well. Do we know what the interaction was between 
Chance's family that night and Bailey's? Yes, and there was interaction between them, which, I mean, could be surprising to some at this point, given the difficulties in that relationship. But we do know that Dawn and Everett tried to call and text their son. When they get no response, they then called his friend and neighbor. Uh, This guy's name is Larry. Larry calls Bailey because, you know, he's her neighbor as well. So he has her information. Then Bailey calls Chance's parents. And so we know there was some interaction between Bailey and Chance's parents that night. She tells them that they were looking for Chance, but she also told them that, you know, he walked away on his own and she expected him back after he cooled down. Then she calls back around 11 p.m. to tell Chance's parents that they had given up looking for him because there was a bad storm in the area. The next morning, Bailey calls the Engelberts again. This time she wants to know had they heard from him. She told them that she was going to file a missing persons report. And of course, no, they had not heard from him. That night they talked again. This is now Sunday night. And Bailey was crying and said, quote, I just know he's coming home in a body bag. End quote. That's according to Dawn, according to Chance's mother. Yeah. Red flag. Chance's parents then drive to Garing to help search for their son. Chance's mother, Dawn, says that just a little more than 48 hours after Bailey reported Chance missing to police, Bailey was asking the police for a death certificate. And Captain Rogers, with the GPD, just kind of looked at her. He was surprised, and he said, Bailey, we don't work with that kind of stuff. He goes on to say, in my heart, I still feel we're going to find him. I'm treating this like my brother's lost and we're going to do everything we can to find him. Now, Bailey is pretty young, so overreacting to a strange and stressful situation might be expected. But mentioning body bags and death certificates within days of chance going missing, major red flags here, Captain. Yeah, and... You know, Brian Eads, the lead investigator, uh, questioned her about this. And basically what he thought was Bailey was not working at the time. So maybe somebody suggested to her, hey, uh, declare him dead, get a death certificate, and then you would get insurance and um, you could get Social Security benefits or something to that degree. It's very strange that you're asking for that right away. It's almost like you know that he's not coming back. It's almost like you know that nobody's going to find him. Um, and, and then Brian Eads also said when she asked for that, that's a huge red flag. Uh, but in her defense, Brian Eads has also said that she's been very cooperative with law enforcement, uh, very respectful to him. But look, we've seen this time and time again. Sometimes investigators or journalists or whoever, they uh, they get one pulled right over their eyes because somebody is treating them nice or with respect. And just kind of filling out the timeline for that night here, Captain, Chance's Aunt Katie, a family friend, not a blood relative, but she's referred to as Aunt Katie, text Chance. And Chance did, did text her back. This was at 9.08 p.m. Now, Chance's text said, and bear with me because this is a little weird. I'm going to try to describe it the best I can. His text to his aunt says, I'm, and then it has no emotion, yellow face emoji, capital I-B-D-E space, capital S-E-R-R, really, and then capital G. So the end of that text is, capital S E R. And then the word really attached to those letters followed by a capital G. That's the text. I'm yellow face emoji, some strange letters, really G and that's it. Yeah. It's supposed to be like a smiley face, but instead of a smile, it's a straight lip, you know, straight mouth, the emoji. Yeah. So, She responds to this text saying, you are what? Are you okay? And she receives no answer. I think the emoji is supposed to represent uh, like annoyed, 
I'm annoyed. And then, like you said, I B D E S E R E A L L Y G. Again, I, I should be able to find an image that I could share on our social media so you can see it. But I mean, the no emoji or the no emotion yellow face emoji, just like the bizarre letters that follow may not have been intended to be part of the text at all. It's really difficult to say to, to make heads or tails of this text. And we know that the aunt responds immediately back and then she receives no answer. So much more case to dive into. Join us back here in the garage. And until next time, be good, be kind, and don't listen.